Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Tesla Universe podcast. I'm your host, Cameron Prince. Uh, this week we're going to talk about some news and catch up on the Colorado Springs model. We've got part three of the Charlotte Muzar video. And we, we're going to start a special um, a section of the podcast we'll have from time to time. And it's going to be kind of a show and tell thing. So uh, first, let's talk about some news. I uh, wanted to give a shout out to uh, my friend Jerry or Archangel Tesla Coil and uh, David Reben, who recently uh, attended the Maker Fair in Pensacola, Florida. I uh, heard they had a good time, saw some nice pictures there. So congratulations on a success with that, guys. Uh, hey, that couldn't be, have been there. Uh, also, uh, a couple of new videos posted uh, since our last podcast. Uh, the first uh, is one from Richard Hull. Uh, Richard is my mentor and also the author of uh, the Tesla Coil Builder's Guide to the Colorado Springs Note and one of their major sources in the Colorado Springs model we're building uh, for the podcast. Uh, in the video, Richard um, talks about magnifiers uh, primarily. Uh, as I mentioned previously, uh, Richard made some really groundbreaking uh, work with that uh, in the early 90s. And uh, he talks about that work. He talks about his book. And um, there's a lot of content about Colorado Springs there, too. So if you're interested, I uh, highly recommend that. Uh, also, I uh, dug up a, a video of... Uh, another mentor of mine, Harry Goldman, um, this video was originally made in 2007 and was launched uh, with the original version of Tesla Universe in 2009. Um, in this video, uh, Harry and I are, are uh, attending uh, the Ed Wingate Teslathon there in uh, New York. And we talk about the, the TCBA, how it started, um, what got Harry interested in Tesla, uh, so uh, a lot of history there. Uh, Harry also was kind enough to give his blessing uh, on the work uh, that I've been doing with Tesla Universe and the project. So uh, we miss you, Harry, and we'll always remember you. Uh, another bonus video, um, a short clip uh, provided by a, a friend of mine, Jeff Parisi. Uh, Jeff formerly owned uh, KVA Effects. Uh, one of the uh, high-voltage companies that produced a lot of Tesla coils for movies and TV. Uh, Bill Weissach was also involved in that project. So this video is just a short clip of a, uh, a press event uh, for the release of a movie uh, entitled uh, Percy Jackson's uh, and the Olympians and the Lightning Thief, I think is the name of it. But uh, they integrated a Tesla coil in some of the... Um, graphics of the movie and it looks really cool so uh, check that out neat little clip also wanted to mention some new members uh, to tesla universe sidsel alpert of dallas texas um, don wolford of Amis iowa and gavin dingley of swindon united kingdom welcome to the universe thanks for joining and uh, i hope you um find what you're looking for or that we assist you in your uh, Tesla research. Um, so let's get started with uh, the Colorado Springs model update. So it's been a couple of weeks since uh, you guys have seen what's been going on. Uh, let me switch over to my screen here and uh, we'll start in SketchUp. So as you can see, I've made a lot of progress. Um, since the last time you may have seen this, uh, I've drawn both uh, the primary uh, secondary form as well as the extra coil. I've got the tower uh, all uh, mocked up there with the proper uh, sizes of pipe uh, overlaying uh, the wood uh, beam at the base. Notice I even got the, uh, the nifty triangular uh, toroid there. Uh, that uh, protects uh, the high voltage from jumping uh, to uh, the ground. Uh, also, uh, you can uh, see that uh, I was able to count um, and figure out that, to the best of my ability, there are 64 primary supports 
Uh, I've got those started there. And most recently, I've been working on uh, the roof structure. So you can see here I'm, I'm using this to uh, try to determine the proper angles uh, of the, the roof there. I got all the uh, bracing drawn on all three sides. And I've started working on these fence posts, um, trying to determine a, an accurate overall size of things. Um, this will determine the scale because I want this, the uh, signpost to be in the perimeter of the model. So uh, initial, I'm still getting these post positions uh, to match all the photos, but um, it looks like 145th scale is going to be where we're at uh, with the model. And that's going to give us a rough size of um, 26 inches wide between the fence posts and 28 inches uh, uh, from front to back. So, uh, and the process I've taken has been to screen cap the model and then overlay it uh, into Photoshop, which we'll switch to here. And uh, you can see that it, it's a process of rotating the image, rotating the model, scaling the image, scaling the model, and you know, doing this back and forth comparison uh, to try to match things as closely as possible. And it's, uh, it's not easy. It's not easy because the photos are warped. And the reason the photos are warped is because of this multi-bellows camera uh, that Mr. Alley and the other former photographer were using. So not only was there a front bellow, but there was a rear. So the lens can be way over here and the plate way over here, both at different angles. So that's going to lead to distortion in the photos uh, this one looks pretty good uh, shows our beams there the, the beams don't line up on this side though which is kind of odd um, uh, here's one of the better ones with tesla and notice that the primary height rides very nicely along there with the insulator sticking up um, the the extra coil not so much but the wall, the uh, top of the wall frame looks good. The primary looks good. So we're going to assume this difference here is um, just an artifact. Or, you know, Tesla had different extra coils, and he was experimenting with the height. So it's hard to say. It's you know, it's going to take a best guess of some sort. Another um, shot I used to make the primary and get it aligned. Uh, the extra coil looks much better in this picture. Uh, then if we keep going, uh, there's another interior one. This, uh, these, this one and the previous interior one are very difficult to get aligned. Uh, like I said, still working through that. One of my favorites that I've been working with is this one. Um, got things looking pretty nice with it. So that's kind of where we are with the uh, Colorado Springs model. Now, I will tell you also, um, I spent a lot of time over the weekend researching uh, laser cutters, engravers, as well as 3D printers, and um, I've narrowed down my, uh, my choices, and I have those devices on the way. So hopefully by next week, we'll be actually building some walls, uh, maybe working on the foundation a little bit. Um, but, you know, there's going to be, I have been fighting this learning curve with SketchUp. Um, and now I'll be fighting another one, learning how to use um, the, that, that equipment. And it's going to be a little trial and error to get the, the proper effect. Because rather than like the wall boards, rather than, you know, cut individual planks to scale and put them together, um, I'm actually going to engrave uh, the lines on the walls and the, and the lines in the floor. Uh, and it will be one, you know, separate pieces that that make up this. So uh, that's going to make for a really accurate model, hopefully. And uh, it's going to save a lot of time. So I'm looking forward to getting started with that. And uh, we'll talk about that more uh, in a future uh, 
podcast. Okay, now let's switch over to the show and tell section. And uh, we're going to get started with um, something small this week, uh, but applicable. And I'll tell you why shortly. Um, let me give you a little background first. Um, back in 2018, uh, I was doing one of my usual searches for Tesla coil information. And I ran across an article in a magazine, uh, a European magazine called Elector. This magazine is very similar to what we have in the United States uh, the Maker Magazine. So it's for in electronics enthusiasts and hobbyists. And uh, let me show you this uh, this magazine. So we switch back over to my screen. Uh, here's the PDF version of Elector, uh, November, December of 2017. And there on the front cover is the Spiral Micro Tesla. So this, to the best of my knowledge, is the first working Tesla coil that is powered by a secondary that is printed on the PC board itself. So this magazine um, provided this uh, coil as a kit and uh, it comes with this nice uh, acrylic uh, case um, has LED illumination and it's powered by a USB plug. Um, very nice little one or so inch spark off five volts. So very impressive. Uh, I ordered one right away. Uh, came in a couple of weeks later. Um, the kit, you basically are building the enclosure and you are uh, populating the board with the larger components. Uh, the capacitors, the switch, uh, the USB connector and that sort of thing. So it took, a, you know, 30 minutes to an hour to, to finish it. And I was making sparks. So here is the board uh, from that kit. This is uh, one of the original um, ones that I ordered from Elector. And uh, you can see that uh, here is our USB connection. That's where the board's powered. Uh, there is a um, microcontroller here. And that is um, handling the pulses uh, to the coil. Um, as well as can do rudimentary music, um, mostly like musical scale or uh, very, uh, very limited uh, uh, musical notes. The 5 volts from the USB port is used to uh, power a DC to DC converter here that boosts that voltage up to 32 volts. Uh, that power then charges the bank of energy storage caps here. And then those are pulsed by this push-pull arrangement of not IGBTs. These are bipolar transistors. And they pulse that power into the tank caps here, which dump that into the primary, which is a single turn there on the back side of the board. That, of course, is induced into the secondary, which are the printed windings there on the top side of the board. And then finally end up at the breakout point uh, there in the center. It's a really great little board, very robust. Um, doesn't get hot, doesn't even get warm, really. All the stuff works with intolerance. Um, the board was designed by uh, a gentleman named Daniel Eindhoven, and Daniel is from Amsterdam. And uh, he and I began corresponding about this um, and actually having uh, a... A, a customized version I'll show you shortly but let's uh, let's show you how this works I'll bring Richard's book over here and use it as a protect the table a little bit so I've got a five cell battery here so I'm actually putting six volts in it but it's perfectly happy with that so I'm gonna plug in this is a, a programming port as well as you can power it by that port so I use it instead of the USB but when we power up there, you'll see it goes into a, uh, a self-test mode. The red light came on, and then after a second, you see it pulsing the LEDs to indicate it's ready. The uh, switch here cycles through four positions. We've got um, uh, three speeds of pulse rate that are programmed into it and a musical scale. So I'll cycle through those now and show you how it works. So there's our 
slowest pulse rate, also our longest spark. And this, this is a board you can touch the output. And you know, you can touch it all day long. Like I said, this thing is really robust. Um, and you, I mean, you can, you can sit there and just ground it out. If you can stand it burning your finger, you can hold it as long as you want. Um, but super robust, um, very solid. And we'll go through the other modes. There's number two, number three, and our musical scale. Unless I'm plug this and I'll show you the customized version. So Daniel and I begin to correspond um, and I actually built my own version of the board. Um, and this is actually how I learned to do surface mount soldering. This is one of the boards um, that was built by uh, Osh Park. And uh, I was using it to test some things. Uh, so that's why it has solder marks over, over here already. Uh, just playing around one of my test boards, but I'll show you what that looks like. And then the the secondary version or the custom version that I built, I built an enclosure for it. So uh, also have a a, uh, a different control system than the stock. Um, we've got our charging port here. We've got fiber optics, so we can actually cycle this uh, using this two-way switch. Uh, so switch it to the left. Uh, gives you um, fiber optic control um, using a standard um, uh, controller or to the right for the original function with just the, the switches to uh, cycle through the four modes. So we'll uh, pop that on and you can see it work too. And for those interested in what that is, it's storage for your breakout point. So there's two more there. So uh, neat, neat little coil. And uh, why, the, why is this, I, you know, I mentioned uh, this was uh, uh, applicable for some reason. Well, the reason that it's applicable is because um, in the Colorado Springs Tesla coil, Tesla had uh, a bifiller winding. And that means there were two turns around the primary form at the base of it. And that, that was the primary. And what Tesla would do, uh, sometimes he would run those winding in, in series, so it would be two turns. But most of his experiments, the two turns were tied together, meaning one, uh, one turn in actuality made up by two separate windings. So if we're going to make a functional uh, version of the model, then this might be the right kind of board to do it. It's already working with a single turn. The question is, how will this drive a three coil setup? Is, is this going to be uh, within a, a reasonable expectation uh, for this kind of controller to power that uh, magnifier? We're gonna find out. I reached out to Daniel uh, over the weekend and um, let him know about the project and what I was thinking about. And I'm waiting to hear back from him. So I'll let you know how that goes. And if we switch back over to uh, the screen here, you can see there's Daniel and I. I actually got to meet him. So I was in Amsterdam in 2019 uh, for work. And while I was there, I was like, hey, Daniel, let me, uh, you know, I called him up and was like, hey, Daniel, um, I'm over, I'm going to be over this way. Um, would you uh, like to get together? So he graciously invited me to his house. This I'm uh, sitting here at his, his uh, kitchen table, and we're looking at some of the boards and actually a a, a new project that he had, had been working on at the time where he was actually using um, a, a wound version of a secondary and a primary, I believe. So uh, Daniel's a really cool, smart guy. Um and if you want to learn more about that, I'll post some links in the comments. All right, uh, let's switch over to the Charlotte Muzar video. Now, um, in this third segment or installment of the video, we're going to hear more background on Kasanovich. 
We're going to hear some uh, tidbits about Tesla's family and what they kind of wanted after Tesla's death. Uh, we're going to hear about Tesla's finances. Um, some people dispute the claim that Tesla was penniless or short of money when he, he died. Miss um, Muzar is going to answer that question. She's also going to talk about more about transferring the estate of Tesla over to Serbia. So I hope you enjoy. Second time I went there, I brought Tesla's ashes to the museum. That was in 57. Right. Yeah. Hold on one second. Are you picking up that refrigerator? Yeah, I'm not picking it up, so we can... One second. I'm sorry. Do all your controls soon now. Okay. Okay. Are you on pause? Right on. <laughs> okay. Uh, what, what shall we say now? Okay. Um, let's... Um, um, let me pick up a few little questions. Yeah, if okay. Wrong with the story you described, yeah. okay? Um, could you tell me, uh, I can tell by the way that you talk about Kosanovich that you have a lot of respect for him. Uh, and I wonder if you could give us a picture of him, if you could tell us what kind of man he was. Uh, Mr. Sava Kosanovich, Sava Nikola Kosanovich, his father was an um, um, Orthodox priest, minister, and um, he had three brothers. One brother was an aviator. He was killed a long, long time ago, I think, in the First World War. Second one was killed, was a doctor. He was killed in 1941 at the outbreak of war in Sarajevo. And the third one was a tradesman, and he lived through the war by the peasants hiding him and seeing that he had food and so forth. And he was a publicist, a politician. He was secretary general of the Democratic Independent Party in Croatia, because they were born and grew up in Croatia, but of the Orthodox faith. Huh? And I remember when I was taking his speech on December 6th. I hadn't met him formally. I was asked by a newspaper to go down and take down his speech for publication. I listened to this man. I looked up on the stage because I was down below and I was thinking, this has got to be the most honest, democratic, sincere politician you'd ever want to meet. And he was. He was a small man, but he was a fighter. He was all heart. I'm sorry, we had to take Okay, so maybe we ought to just start over, and if you could tell us about Sava Kosanovich. Uh, Sava Kosanovich was Secretary General of his uh, Independent Democratic Party in Croatia. He was a member of parliament in Belgrade when the war broke out. Um, he was, in stature, he was small, fine-boned. In fact, in the office in New York, we had a nickname for him. We called him Mr. Pettibone because he was sort of fragile. He's red-headed, very, very fair, kind person, and um, a fighter. He had never let an opera or anything slide. Anytime, he was a good publicist. And he'd always say, the important thing when some catastrophe happens, he says, the important thing is to, uh, to react immediately. Immediately. Don't wait to consult here and there. You have to react right away to set matters straight. He, um, Oh, what else can I tell him? You can tell me what uh, his, the depth of his feeling for uh, his uncle was. He adored him, he thought, you know, uh, he was... Kasanovich adored Tesla. Kasanovich adored Tesla, because if we others who weren't related to him felt the way we did towards him, you can imagine how he did. And uh, he was very concerned about his well-being and so forth. And. Um, I'm sure financially he helped him towards the end because what uh, Tesla was getting from the 
government from the um, Tesla Institute in Belgrade didn't cover all of his expenses. And um, he, um, Mr. Kasanovich to me was a mentor and he was, um, sort of took the place of the father I lost earlier. I learned a lot from him. I always say through him and his family, I really got almost a college education because they were very cultured people. And uh, they took an interest in me, so I was with them a lot. And um, I remember we were in Belgrade on um, December 7th, 1951, when we celebrated our 10th anniversary. I says, Mr. Gassanis, remember we met, you know, like 10 years ago, met many things that happened. He had a sister through the aunt, as they say, as the Serbians say, a cousin. She was a pediatrician. And since uh, Mr. Gassanis was a bachelor, she came to New York, to, to Washington, to act as um, official hostess in the embassy. She was a brilliant, bright, fast-thinking woman and a big asset to, uh, to the embassy. And his other, um, his other uh, relatives, as I said, his oldest brother was a pilot. He was killed. His second brother, who was a doctor, was killed in 1941, outbreak of war in Sarajevo. So there was just uh, Yubisha and Savica Kasanovich left. None of them married, so there were no, no offspring from the Kasanovich family. Okay, now, um, th there's some cynical thought okay, that Tesla, near the end of his life, was being used politically as a kind of a political propaganda tool and um, by either the provisional government or the new government. And what, is your, what is your experience with that? As far as uh, Tesla, his be be being um, used by various sides, various uh, groups, I have no idea. But I'm sure he was. I'm sure he was. Everybody was... You, you'll have to start that by, um, I'm sure Tesla was. I'm sure Tesla was used by, uh, by various factions. For good or for bad, I don't know. Because I wasn't in on that. But I know that uh, Mr. Kasanovich was fighting to keep him, so to speak, out of the clutches of the bad guys. Who were the bad guys? The ones that were, uh, they were supporting Mihailovich and the fascist forces. And those were the only bad guys. Well, who else was there at that time? What about in the United States? Oh, I don't know. I don't know about who the bad guys were in the United States. I'm sure we had a lot of them, because everywhere you went, you know, loose lips, sink ships, and all that. We had to be careful on that. So I have no idea. I just know what I read about, you know, what I read since then about it. I and mean, that isn't very much in that respect. You, um, you mentioned that you were involved in settling Tesla's estate and yeah. settling the debts. Yeah. You, could, you could also help us with a big controversy here. And that was some people say that Tesla actually wasn't in debt when he died, or that he, you know, he's always said being projected as being dying penniless, and uh, others say that he was not. What is your experience from settling his estate? What were his financial? Uh... Yeah, I about um, Tesla's estate uh, debts at the time of his death. I knew he was getting six hundred dollars a month, and as one correspondent from Belgrade recently, he was surprised. He says six hundred dollars a month. I says. When you're paying hotel bill and your meals and you have people working for you because he couldn't go out anywhere. He had to pay people to do all this. That didn't go far. And uh, as far as his debt is, debts are concerned, it could, uh, Mr. Kasanich did not feel free to pack up 
Tesla's estate property and ship it to Yugoslavia until he settled all the dates, debts. He had $10,000 set aside, a fund set aside by the, I don't know whether it was the Yugoslav government or the institute um, in Belgrade, and he instructed the lawyer to advertise, to get all the debts collected, reported, and collect all the property. And when this was cleared, to notify me, and we would ship them. And another thing that happened with this is things, when all of this, um, these trunks and cases and files and well, boxes were collected, they had to be packed for shipment overseas. We had at that time, uh, even during the war, Yugoslav Seamen's Club in New York. They were the seamen that were caught off, who didn't have berths. And um, so when there was an opening someplace why they would go through the Seamen's Club, because the Yugoslav ships were not plying the seas. And uh, they were very uh, great admirers of this. And when they found out this was happening, they says, we'll pack the things. And they voluntarily, they got the lumber and everything and packed them all and had them shipped because the agent who was uh, having all this loaded met me on the sh on board ship when I was leaving. And he says, Charlie, you, he says, you'll be glad to know what the Yugoslav seamen did for the Tesla estate. They packed all these things so we could ship them to Yugoslavia. Hey, Shara, what was it like to actually be the person who actually carried Nikola Tesla's ashes to uh, Yugoslavia? What was that experience like? It's, um, all the time, uh, the ashes were at the um, Ardley Cemetery up in, uh, on the Ferncliff, Fern thank you. Okay. Ferncliff. All right. His ashes were at Ferncliff. I was in the group that uh, escorted the, um, the the body from the cathedral up to Ferncliff to Ardley's. And we just, uh, Subashic gave a little speech there, and that's all, no further ceremonies. And then later on, uh, information was received that the cremation took place. Okay. And the ashes stayed there. And uh, these bills were being sent to me to some insignificant amount. And then in 56, when I was preparing to go to Yugoslavia, 57, I wanted to know what to do with the ashes. And Mr. Kasanovich had died in November of 56. So I wrote to Misa, Dr. Trebojevic, his cousin, as a, his heir, I says, Mitza, let me know what you want me to do. I'm leaving the States now. If you want them there, this would be a good time for me to bring them. And she conferred with um, uh, Velko Korac, who was then director of the museum, and he wrote me, bring the ashes. So I wrote Yard Ardleys and asked them to send the package to me at the embassy. The package came, it was a little parcel post package, you know, corrugated box. I put it in the file. When I was leaving, I packed it among my, uh, in my trunk that was gonna go down the hole. I never saw them. And then when I got to Belgrade, I handed the package over to the museum. And that's all. Okay, we're back. And I think that concludes this episode. Thank you so much for your time and attention. We will see you next week.